All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Callie. I am the rehab manager here at Howard. We are very excited to have Dr. Larson here for our wellness series today. He's going to be talking about deep brain stimulation. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to him, let him introduce himself and get started with the presentation. All right. We're being recorded. I got it. All right. Excellent. All right. Welcome. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a little. I'm getting a higher. Yeah, all right. My voice is usually shot at the end of the day, so I need all the help I can get. Uh, so uh, I see a few familiar faces that I've seen uh, in, in our clinics, but um, I'm going to talk a bit today about uh, a technique that we use uh, for Parkinson's called deep brain stimulation. I'm not going to... Um, uh, I'm not going to talk the entire time. We're going to kind of go over some things, and then we'll we can do some discussion, the question and answers. I'm hoping those, I'm hoping that goes away. Oh, all right. Cool. That's good. Except that my slides aren't advancing for some reason. Got to figure this out. Oh, now I'm really loud. Is that better? Okay, all right. Okay, uh, how many people here know what deep brain stimulation is? How many people have it, maybe? Nobody? Okay, all right. So I, I like to assume that people don't know very much, and that way we can kind of start from scratch. So, so deep brain stimulation, it's a technique that's been around for actually a really long time. It was FDA approved in the United States in the, in the late 90s, in 1997. And the easiest way to think about it, it's like a pacemaker for your brain. Uh, it, it's a, an implanted device with a little battery pack and some wires that go up to the top of the head and then uh, through two little holes in the skull down into the brain. And we implant it in a part of the brain that is involved in the circuit that controls our movements. Uh, and it uses high frequency stimulation to modulate abnormal brain activity in this area. Uh, and this is what it looks like for, for patients that have it implanted. We usually put two electrodes in, one in the right, one in the left. The motor circuit that controls our movements, it's actually, there are two of them. There's one in the right and one in the left. They're mirror images of each other. And generally, the circuit on the right helps movement on the left side of the body and vice versa. Some tasks that we do, like walking, actually use both sides of the circuit. Most patients with Parkinson's like to walk. Uh, and they have symptoms on both sides, so we usually put two electrodes in. Uh, and schematically, this is kind of what it looks like. So if that little orange oval is a, a, a part of that brain circuit that's involved in movement, in this case, it's a, a structure called the STN of the subthalamic nucleus. Uh, this is what an electrode looks like when it's implanted in an area. These electrodes have generally four little metal rings at the, at the bottom end of them. That's these gray squares. And we can stimulate around any one of these that we want to. We can sort of assign stimulation to be centered around any one of these. We can use several of them in combination to stimulate a larger area. We can turn the stimulation sort of amplitude or the way of think about it is we can turn the volume up and we can stimulate a larger area. And then when we turn the device off, it's like it's not there. So the nice thing about deep brain stimulation is that it's adjustable and the effects of it are reversible. So if you turn the device off, it's like it's not there. Uh, this is in contrast to some of the older procedures that we used to do where we would put a probe in this part of the brain and burn a hole in it. We would intentionally destroy part of the motor circuit to try to normalize things like tremor. That's not something that's adjustable or reversible. We don't like burning holes in the brain. We'd rather modulate it more elegantly. So that's why we've moved pretty much exclusively in most cases to deep brain stimulation. Now. Uh, if you've heard about DBS or been on the internet, you've, you've uh, probably seen videos of patients having this operation where they're awake during the procedure. And we actually used to do it that way. And there are still some centers around the country that do what we call awake surgery. Um, this was necessary because, you know, we're trying to get this electrode into a really specific spot and we can't see inside your head in the operating room. And so we would have patients awake so we could put the electrode in, turn it on, and check the responses, see if symptoms got better, or see if you were having side effects, and we needed patients to give us feedback. Here's an example of a patient uh, that's got really bad tremor. Um, 
I'm going to try to, hopefully I'm not standing in front of the screen for everybody, but we're going to turn this electrode on. And as we turn the amplitude of stimulation up, you're going to see this tremor gets better as we turn it up. So in the old days, this was a way of sort of confirming that we were in a good spot. Um, it's good for us. It's not so easy if you're a patient undergoing a brain operation while you're awake. It's a little bit intimidating. Uh, so we have moved to what's called an MRI guided technique. So we've developed a way of doing these surgeries inside of an MRI scanner with you completely under anesthesia. And because you're in an MRI scanner, we, we can see inside your brain. And these little areas that we want to implant, they're visible on MR. So we have the ability to uh, use MR images and this skull-mounted aiming device that sort of mounts on the top of the head after you go to sleep. We can use this device to line, align this aiming device to the intended target. We can pass an electrode through there. We can take pictures as we're doing this to make sure the electrode is going right where we want it to go. Uh, and it's a very accurate technique, and it, uh, again, uh, eliminates the need for patients to be awake. So what does it really do for you? So here's an example, a, a, a typical uh, patient uh, off their medications that's got pretty advanced Parkinson's disease. So you can see she's really stiff. She's very bradykinetic, meaning her movements are very slow. You can see how rigid she is. She's got a lot of rigidity. And we're asking her to take a couple of steps. Uh, she has difficulty initiating her walking, initiating gait, and you, as you can see, she has some tremor as well. So this is what a patient looks like uh, off meds, and she she's probably about, I can't remember how far into her diagnosis she was, I want to say maybe 12 or 14 years. So here she is with DBS, so this is no meds, just stimulation. And, you know, we don't make people perfect, but we make them a lot better. We can make movements more natural, we can speed up movements, I like the little wave she gets at the end here. <laughs> now, if you if you feel her, she's still a little rigid, and if you ask her to hold a glass, she you know intermittently has a little bit of tremor, but she's she's significantly better than she was uh, just with medications alone. So, there have been a number of studies to look at. You know, uh, is this really uh, better than just continuing to treat people with medications? And as we're going to talk about in a minute, early on in Parkinson's, medications usually work pretty darn well. Uh, as the disease gets worse, because it's a progressive disorder, medications start to lose their effectiveness. And so this was a study that we did. Uh, it was actually through the VA system in, in collaboration with a couple of universities. It was the largest DBS study that's really ever been done. It was over 300 patients. And the first part of the study looked at uh, patients that enrolled, you either immediately had surgery or you had continued sort of optimal medical treatment with medications with an expert movement disorders neurologist. And we looked at, at the end of that six-month period, was there a difference between patients that had surgery and patients that continued to have sort of optimal medical management? And the answer was the DBS really won in a big way. So, so we, we looked at increases in on time. This is time when your medication's working really well. And at the end of six months, the people that had surgery had four and a half more hours of good on time during the day, as opposed to patients that continued to just take medications, which had none. Um, we looked at, at uh, uh, measures of movement, and there was you know, a significant, more than twice the amount of improvement in, in, uh, in, in clinically meaningful improvements in motor function. And we looked at quality of life measures, things like how happy are you? Do you do the, are you able to do the things that you want to do? Can you engage in hobbies? Do you go out with friends? Um, and there were significant increases in quality of life measures, seven of the eight measures in the DBS group, and really just one in the, in the treatment group. In fact, the data was so compelling that about halfway through the study, the FDA came to us and said, you have to stop the medication arm. Just go ahead and operate on people. And so if they enrolled, they just got surgery right away. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how we decide who's a good candidate. Uh, and this is actually probably the most important thing about DBS is, is, is picking who is going to be a good candidate for it. Because not everyone, as you're going to see in a minute, uh, is, is necessarily a good candidate for DBS. Uh, and if we do a good job at picking people for surgery, who do we think is a good candidate? They almost always get significant improvement. 
So uh, the first thing is making sure that you have Parkinson's. And that may seem like a stupid thing to say, uh, but uh, for those of you that have it or, ha or a caretaker or a loved one is someone who has it, you know that there's really not one definitive test that really proves that you have it. Um, generally, it's a, a smart neurologist listening to your symptoms and feeling your movements and looking at your movements and saying, I think you have Parkinson's disease. And they might get a scan. I've noticed since coming from California, uh, people in Tucson love to give these, these scans are called DAT scans or DAT scans. Uh, and they, uh, if you have Parkinson's, they're abnormal. Uh, they'll show some loss of dopamine in a certain part of the brain. The problem with that is if you have other brain disorders that are like Parkinson's, it will also be abnormal. Or if you're just of a certain age, it's just going to be abnormal because of your age. If you're 86 and you have a DAT scan, it's probably going to look abnormal. So it's only about 60 to 70 percent uh, uh, accurate, if you will, for for diagnosing specifically Parkinson's disease. So, and there are a lot of other brain disorders that kind of mimic Parkinson's, but they end up being something else. The reason it's important for us to differentiate these things is because if you really have Parkinson's disease, DBS can help. If you have one of these other disorders, it's not going to help. So um, we look for certain things. We look for certain symptoms, uh, and we look for something called Cinemet responsiveness. So I use Cinemet. How many people are on Cinemet that are patients in the, yeah. So it's it's uh, Cinemet or it's Carbidopa Levodopa is the other name for it, or some variation of that, like Watari, for example. Uh, this is basically an oral form of dopamine. And uh, I should be looking at the camera for the people online. Hi, people. Uh, so uh, um, almost everybody is on some form of that medication. And if you really have Parkinson's disease, it usually works pretty darn well. The one exception to that is tremor. Tremor is an interesting symptom. Tremor doesn't always get better with medications, but the other symptoms generally do. Things like slowness of movement, shuffling gait, stiffness, just like the lady I showed you on the video. So the, the more obvious a response that a patient has to these medications, the more confidence we have that they really have Parkinson's disease. If you have one of these other disorders, like there's a, there's a very nasty brain disorder, it's called PSP, pseudobulbar palsy. It's one of these diseases that mimics Parkinson's disease. It can have an abnormal DAT scan, the symptoms early on can look very much like Parkinson's tremor, slowness of movement, but it's a different it's a different beast altogether, and it doesn't get better with medications, and it won't get better with DBS. So one of the things that we do is we like to do a thing called an on-off test. We have you not take your meds the morning of. We have you come to the neurologist office, and actually I send patients here sometimes to to the therapist here because they can do on-off tests here. And we basically, you're going to look like hell, if I may use a medical term, right? You, you haven't taken your meds. Usually people. You hang out until your medicines kick in and you're moving better. And when you feel like you're doing well, like you're on, then we retest you. And we look for at least a 30% improvement in that severity score. And if you have that, if you have 35% or 40% or 50%, the odds are that you really do have Parkinson's disease. The other reason we like that test is that I often tell people, and I think it's on a slide coming up, there's basically five symptoms that really tremor, slowness of movement, stiffness, walking trouble, and if you have them, dyskinesias. Does everyone know what it is? take your medications. It's actually yeah, it's not itself. It's a side effect of taking these medications for a long period of time. You're on yeah. levodopa, let's say, for more than yeah. a week. Yeah. That would be sort of the yeah. 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 Fox, yeah. the first to boy for, for dyskinesia. Uh, these, these kind of involuntary movements. So I tell people, those are the five things that you can expect to get better. Now, occasionally, someone will say, you know, my speech is terrible when my meds wear off, but when I take my meds, my speech is normal. Um, if there's a symptom that gets better with medication, it usually gets better with yes. 
So that's one of the reasons that we like this on-off test. It gives us a clue. If you have a symptom that, that really does get better, then we know, okay, well, that's probably going to get better with TBS. Does that make sense? Um, we, we like to have people that are uh, having really good function when their medications are working well. We call it having a good on state. On means your meds are working, the planets are all aligned, the timing is just right, and we can um, uh, see what you're looking like when you're at your very best. And, and for people that have an on state where they feel pretty close to normal, uh, that's a good sign because DBS, it can't make you much better than you are when the meds are working their very best. The difference is usually with medications, when you get to a certain stage in your Parkinson's, you fluctuate. So you're on and then you're off and you're up and down throughout the day. DBS can keep you in that on state, but keep it there for big chunks of the day, if not all day. Uh, so a great surgical candidate is someone who they're on state, they look great in their on state, they look terrible in their off state, and they spend a lot of time off. We can really improve that patient's quality of life. Again, this is the symptom profile. These are the big, I call them the big five, tremor. Rigidity is really another way of saying stiffness. Bradykinesia is a medical term of saying slowness of movement, so slow movements, walking issues, and then these dyskinesias. Um, those are the big five. If, if a patient comes and they say, I want DBS, and I ask them, well, what are your top three symptoms? Uh, you know, what are the top three things that bother you? And um, if the answers are uh, I fatigue and my memory's bad, and uh, every time I stand up, I get super dizzy. Those are three symptoms of Parkinson's, right? Uh, fatigue is very common in Parkinson's. Memory troubles are common in Parkinson's. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Blood pressure problems are common. Those things don't get better with DBS. So if the symptoms you're having are symptoms that don't tend to respond to surgery, then putting holes in your head is probably not a great idea. Uh, but if you come in and say, my three, you know, my top three things that bother me are I, I got tremor, I got terrible dyskinesia, and I shuffle when I walk when my meds aren't working, we can help that. All right. In the old days, which was not that long ago, the early 2000s, um, we would have neurologists that would not refer patients for surgery until they were really, really bad. You know, 20 years into their, 30 years into their diagnosis, in a wheelchair, medications don't work. Uh, that is someone who's progressed to the point where we can't help. DBS is not going to rescue a patient from that kind of situation. The men still have to work at some point for DBS to work. Um, so we can't really sort of rescue someone. If you And a good rule of thumb is if someone has progressed to the point where they can't walk, even when their meds are working their very best, it's probably not worth the risk of doing a brain operation because you're not really going to make a big impact on that particular patient. The opposite is true. I will have patients that come and see me and they were just, they were like, I was diagnosed six months ago. And uh, I want to have DBS, and I and they're on three tablets of Cinemet a day, and they feel really good. They look really normal. Uh, we're not going to make them any better than that. So there's no. It doesn't make sense to do the risk of a brain operation if the meds are working really well. It's this kind of middle stage where the meds become less effective, or you develop dyskinesias. Let's talk a little bit about memory because this is really important. So memory troubles are super common in Parkinson's disease. If you very carefully test patients that have Parkinson's, you very frequently find troubles with specific types of memory. It's not all memory across the board, uh, but it's specific types. We call it executive function tasks. There's things like keeping track of a list or prioritizing a list of tasks or uh, you know, doing something that requires multiple steps. It's hard to keep track of those things. And if they're mild troubles with memory, it doesn't preclude us from doing surgery. But some patients, as they progress, they will actually develop really profound memory problems. And they'll actually, if you test them, they'll actually meet the criteria for dementia. Uh, and if patients have gotten to that point, surgery is not going to make the memory better, and it can actually make it worse. Um, the other thing is, 
we as the team doing this, we're very dependent on people being able to tell us what they're feeling. So if we implant a patient and we turn the device on and we do some initial settings uh, and we have them come in a month later, uh, we need to know, okay, wh what have you know, what's better, what's not better, what symptoms are you still noticing, when do you notice them? We're extremely dependent on that feedback to know, okay, we need to adjust the stimulator settings to make this better or reduce this side effect. And if the patients can't communicate with us what's going on, we're in the dark. So um, uh, it's a complicated therapy. It can make memory worse if it's bad already. So, so we always do very detailed cognitive testing to make sure that we know uh, what's, the, what's the status of the memory before we start doing surgery. How many people have heard there's a, there's a cutoff for DBS? You can't have it if you're over 80 or you can't have it if you're over whatever age. There are some centers that actually have sort of a hard cutoff. Um, if I may use a medical term, I think that's bullshit. Um, uh, people's physiologic age, uh, it, 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 what shape you're in is far more important than the actual number of your age. Uh, I do know centers, however, that will not implant someone if they're over 80. They won't even see them. And uh, uh, I and we at Banner don't really have a hard cutoff. I didn't have it before. I don't have it now. Um, we've learned that, uh, you know, a 45-year-old that's got, has that's had three heart attacks and has got five stents in their heart and is on blood thinners is far more scary from a surgical standpoint than an 83-year-old that's, that, that's pretty healthy. So we don't have a hard age cutoff, but you will find some centers that do that. They'll come around. Um, the other thing is patient expectations. So I always tell people when they come and see me, look, this is not a cure. Um, uh, it's not going to help every single symptom that you have. It's not going to stop the disease from slowly getting worse. Um, what it can do is it can make those big five symptoms better, uh, but it's a time investment. You have to come in, you have to get adjusted. Um, there are batteries that need to be replaced periodically. There are new rechargeable devices that are coming out on the market now that you can recharge, but you have to recharge them. So there's some maintenance to it. Um, so it's a bit of a time investment. It's a brain operation. So there are risks of doing it. There's about a 1% risk of causing bleeding in the brain as we're putting the electrode in. And this causes symptoms. It's like having a stroke. Uh, it can cause temporary or permanent side effects, things like weakness on one side of the body, memory troubles, speech troubles, uh, changes in personality. Um, the risk of, of enough bleeding that causes symptoms is, is a little less than 1%, it's about 0.6%. There are up to two or 3% of people that will have a, a small amount of bleeding that doesn't cause symptoms. And the only reason we know it happened is because we're now doing these procedures inside an MRI scanner, we can detect really, really small amounts of blood. So we'll sometimes see a little blood tracking along the electrode. Technically, that's someone that's had bleeding, but they wake up, they're perfectly fine. There's no symptoms from it. So that's the worst thing that can happen. Um, people ask me, well, you know, how bad could that really be? I mean, uh, you know, we could give you a big brain hemorrhage and kill you or put you in a coma, which I think is probably worse. Um, we do extraordinary measures to keep that risk as low as possible. We check the blood before to make sure that the blood clotting is normal. Uh, we know certain areas of the brain where the vessels tend to be more present or more fragile. Uh, but despite all of those, all of that knowledge and all of these precautions that we take, there's still this risk. Um, the more common thing that can go wrong is infection because we're opening you up and we're putting a battery pack and wires in you. And there's about a three to 4% risk of infection. If it's a mild infection, we can usually treat it with just antibiotics. But if it's a, if it's a deep infection that gets on the battery pack or the wires, uh, the only way to get rid of the infection is to take whatever part of the system is infected, take it out. Uh, treat with antibiotics to get rid of the infection. Usually, thank goodness, it's the battery pack that usually gets infected. And uh, we can take that out, but leave the brain wires in place. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a second operation to take the infected battery pack out, and then it's a third operation to put it back in, a fresh one back in. So infections are always treatable, but they can be very inconvenient. Um, I always put, you know, uh, 
and this was more of an issue in the in the in the first decade of of this century when DBS was fairly new. We didn't really we weren't as good at picking people, to be honest. And we would implant patients occasionally that just didn't get any improvement at all. I'm happy to report that that's actually really rare now because we just understand much better how to select patients. Um, and usually if we implant someone and they just do not get better at all, it's almost always because they really had something other than Parkinson's disease. Um, the other issue is that if your surgeon, like me, is not good at getting electrode in the right spot. So I tell people the three most important things about DBS surgery is location, 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 right? It's like real estate. So um, uh, you've got to make sure the electrode gets in the right spot. This is a hard number to try to figure out. Centers that are at universities that do this a lot and tend to be very good at it will publish what their results are. And the results are always good because they're experienced and they do it a lot. Uh, centers that do, you know, half a dozen DBS cases a year are going to be less experienced. And uh, if the electrodes aren't going in the right spot, they're probably not going to crow about that, right? So it's, it's hard to get at that number. Uh, we tried to get at this number. We had one of our residents when I was in San Francisco look at the Medicare database, and they tried to look at diagnoses of uh, how many times did someone go and have surgery to, uh, to replace or move an electrode in the brain for Parkinson's. And the only reason you would ever remove or move an electrode is if it's infected, and we know the rate for that is 3%. If it breaks, and we know the rate for that, it's really low, it's less than 1%. The third reason to do it is if it's in the wrong place. And uh, when we looked at that database over you know, 30,000 or almost 30,000 patients or 30,000 procedures, it, it looked like 15% in this one database and almost 30% in another database were for reasons other than an infection or a broken wire. So that would imply that there are a lot of electrodes being put in across the U.S. that don't end up in the right spot. So um, there are some ways around that. We like this MR-guided technique because you can be sure, you can see where the electrode is going. Uh, and so that gives you a high degree of confidence that it's where it needs to be. There's also this, this concept now called current steering. So these electrodes in the plant past have had just a solid ring that we're stimulating around. And I'll show you a picture of it. Um, it's a solid band. So these four little rings and they, they, they stimulate concentrically, meaning it's like putting a light in the middle of this room. It's gonna shine equally in all directions, like a lantern. Um, you'll also notice there are four electrodes on the end of this little device we put in the head. We do that so that we can stimulate around um, we can pick which ones we stimulate around. Well, one way to give you more flexibility is to make more electrodes. So this is a, an example of an electrode that came out in the market a couple of years ago. Instead of having four little rings, it's got eight smaller ones. And, one that, and, and they're over a larger span. So what that allows you to do is you can individually control the amount of current or the spheres, the red spheres around the electrode. So you can shape the current to sort of maximize stimulation in this, in this uh, in this little orb that we're trying to stimulate. Let's say that you put the electrode in a little deeper. Let's say it was just a millimeter or two deeper than usual. We can just use the upper ones. So we have this ability to sort of shape current in the vertical direction along the electrode. That's helpful, uh, but a more common problem is this. So here, now we're looking sort of from the top down. So here's a lead or a DBS electrode that's in this, this uh, structure. And when we turn it on, it's going to stimulate concentrically, right? So it's going to stimulate in all directions. If the electrode is smack dab in the middle where it's supposed to be, this is fine. Uh, now, to put a little scale on this, uh, that, that STN that we're showing, it's only about four millimeters wide. And the electrode is just over a millimeter wide. So you've got to, your accuracy has got to be ideally a millimeter or less. Uh, so let's just take this, this lead and we're going to move it off to the side a little bit, just a millimeter. So now you can see we're spreading red stimulation outside of the STN. And it turns out there's a, there's a big structure just, just where the green arrows are. It's a big bundle of nerves that goes to the muscles of the voice box. So if you stimulate this patient, 
and you spread stimulation into that other area, it's going to cause the speech to get tight uh, or the words to be slurry like someone's been drinking a little bit. So uh, a way to uh, avoid that is to take that ring and break it into segments. We call this a segmented lead. So there's now three surfaces instead of one. Uh, and you can stimulate around one or two of them. Uh, let me go back. And you can avoid spreading stimulation into that adjacent area. This seems pretty obvious. Um, and many of us were asking for this for years and years and years. And there was one company that basically uh, was on the market making a DBS system, and they just had a concentric electrode. Now there are three manufacturers on the market, uh, and that has been good because it spawned competition. Uh, and now all three manufacturers, and the three manufacturers in no particular order, <laughs> since this is an Abbott uh, hosted event, but Boston Scientific, Abbott, and Medtronic are the three companies. I should do it alphabetically, I guess, right? I should do, I should. Um, but all three companies now make these segmented electrodes. So um, we believe that the rate of, of having to go back to surgery because the electrode is not in a good position is going to go way down. And we've actually done an analysis and it looks like that may be the case. Of course, if your surgeon is good to begin with, you don't have to worry about it. Um, just to close up, uh, cause, uh, I don't want to talk too long and I want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, a final concept that's very interesting is this concept of what we call closed loop stimulation. So what do we mean by that? Right now, these electrodes, these systems, they're fairly stupid. And what I mean by that is you, your patient comes in, they go to their neurologist, the neurologist sets the stimulation parameters, right? We're going to stimulate at this frequency. Uh, around this little ring at this amplitude, and it just kind of does that 24 seven. Um, what we'd like is for the system to be able to sense what's going on in your brain and adjust itself accordingly. If you have Parkinson's, you know that your symptoms are not constant. They fluctuate throughout the day, right? Um, so this is a concept called closed loop stimulation. We can sense brain activity that feeds back to the system and then we can adjust stimulation accordingly. Um, and this is not a pipe dream any longer. So my old partner in San Francisco um, was doing this. So hopefully the pointer is gonna show up on Zoom. So this is, a, this is an x-ray from the operating room. Phil's got two electrodes in the brain. But if you look up here, there's, there's a little sensing electrode on the surface of the brain. And this is over the part of the brain called motor cortex that's involved in our movement. And what Phil showed is that uh, you can detect signals based on symptoms. So this is just a little energy profile. It's just a little brain activity profile of a single patient. Um, and this patient had dyskinesia. So these are these involuntary movements that I was talking about earlier. So when he was recording from this patient, if the patient was not having dyskinesias, it was the red trace. If they were having dyskinesia, dyskinesia, it was the blue trace. And you see, when they're having dyskinesia, there's this really obvious peak in this brain activity. Uh, and Phil could uh, record from this patient's brain, and they would fill out a little journal throughout the day. And whenever they were having dyskinesias, they would say, okay, I'm, dyskinesias are starting at 302. And then they would last for 20 minutes, and then, and then uh, they, they would say, okay, my dyskinesias are gone. And when they when they when they took the patient's report of when they were having dyskinesia and compared it to the recordings, this was picking it up every time. So this is an example of a signal that a DBS system could use to change the stimulation. Oh, this patient's having dyskinesia. Let's do this different with the stimulation to uh, help with that. So now this is not ready for prime time, uh, but these systems are gaining this capability. So I think if we standing here three years from now, maybe five years from now, maybe two years from now, uh, these systems will have that ability to sense and feedback. So that's very, very exciting. All right, that's all I have for the slides, unless you want to see vacation pictures from last year. You know. uh, actually, that's that's a lie. I haven't been on vacation since, since before the pandemic. Um, all right, I'm going to, so, yeah, exactly. Um, all right, I think I'll stop sharing. And um, we've got living people in the room and living people online. So I don't know how you want to 
how we want to do the questions. Yeah, we're going to some people in the room first, and then if anyone wants to type anything in the chat, I'll read them to you. Okay, so we're going to prioritize the real people, not these fake people online. All right. Sorry, fake people online. Especially Brian, we're picking on Brian. So any questions here before we go online? Yeah. Uh, wow. Exactly. Yeah. Line. Yeah. For six years. Yeah. He has every single symptom of purpose. He has not done well on cinnamon, three trials, or advancing two trials. Yeah. He's been to Sherman, he's recommended to you. Yeah. 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 He's probably not if he if he really so that so for the people online um that's a that's a horrible story so uh was it really lyme disease did he actually have a yep yeah so yep both western block and Alyssa and the reef for my yeah Within six weeks, he was hospitalized and could not walk with his baby. Wow. Yeah. yeah so this isn't so that's a first of all, I'm terribly sorry. That's a horrible story. And it's there, there, uh, this is not uncommon though, right? So uh, um, infectious or someone has a stroke in a particular, if you have a stroke in, in this part of the motor circuit, you can develop symptoms. So, and, and, and so there are a lot of things that can give you. Parkinson's like symptoms, and we call them Parkinsonian symptoms, right? Um, the, the, uh, the, the issue is that the reason DVS works in Parkinson's patients is because their, their motor circuit is intact except for one area where the dopamine cells are dying off. In, in your husband's case, it's damage to, it's much wider spread damage through the whole motor circuit. And uh, the reason cinnamon and the medications work in Parkinson's, again, is one part of the circuit is bad, but the rest of it is okay. And these other disorders, it's it, the, the, if you want to think about it as damage, and I think in his, I mean, I don't think that's an inappropriate term in his because he had a bad infection. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it would not really help him. Does he have a lot of tremor? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Diagnosed different times. Okay. Yeah. And because of my background, I keep saying atypical, something else. Yeah. yeah. Can I pick your brain? Are you familiar with uh, ultrasound ablation? Yeah. So uh, the one, the one symptom. What? Uh, well, I don't want to get into a. a you know. A <laughs> this is rattle. Right the one symptom uh, that you can potentially make better is tremor. So uh, tremor uh, is a little different, it, and there's a there's a different part of the brain that you can intervene in. It's part of the motor circuit, but it's not a typical Parkinson's area that we stimulate. You can potentially help tremor, but that would be the only symptom we can help. And what you just referred to, so this is a good question. So there's a uh, she asked a question about a technique called focused ultrasound. So focused ultrasound is a is is very hot topic now. This is a a non quote unquote non-invasive way of destroying part of the motor circuit to try to make symptoms better. Before we had DBS, that's what we did. We would um, drill a hole, put a probe down in your brain, heat it up, burn a hole in part of the circuit, burn it away, and that would make tremor and slowness better. It it's a technique called lesioning. Pallidotomy is one of the operations. That was the name of it. Thalamotomy is 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 another one. And uh, they they can be very effective. We moved away from them because they're destructive, and because you can't do them on both sides of the body. Uh, you if you if you if you burn a hole in the motor circuit on both sides, what happens is your speech and memory. There's a very high chance of your speech and memory going down the tubes. So um, focused ultrasound is getting a lot of attention because it it's non-invasive. You don't have to have an incision. It's basically a lesioning procedure. So that's the operation we were doing 30 years ago. It's just a new way of doing it. Um, the guy that invented it is a guy named Dr. Jeff Elias, who's at University of UVA in Virginia. 
And it drives him nuts when people say it's non-invasive. It's like, you know, we're, we're using high frequency ultrasound waves to burn a hole in your head. That's pretty invasive. There's just not an incision. So um, that could help, but again, it's only gonna help tremor. It's not gonna help the other symptoms. What do you think of that? Because that's very non-invasive to put a unit on the top. Yeah, I mean, there, there's there's lot there's lots of other. I don't have any personal experience with that. Uh, although that's a really really good group. Um, you know, there's a device now you can wear in your wrist for tremor. People with a central tremor are using it. Um, they're just very new and they're sort of specific to certain centers. And we're just, I just don't know enough about it yet because um, they haven't really published widely on it yet. Yeah. Of course, you can still come see me. Sure, fine. Yes, sir. Great question. So I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, the effects, you know, it doesn't cure your Parkinson's and it doesn't keep it from slowly progressing. So eventually, at some point, um, symptoms can either start to come back. Or more commonly, what happens is other symptoms that weren't disabling early on can start to become disabling, like memory, for example. So uh, what I tell people, the range is pretty broad because patients with Parkinson's progress at different rates. You know, we have some patients that are, they're only five, six, seven years into their diagnosis, and they're already at a point where they're, they're fluctuating and they have dyskinesia. Other people don't get to that point until they're 15, you know, 18 years in. Uh, but what I tell people is, you know, it's not unusual. A typical patient will get, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years of good sustained benefit. And then at some point, let's just say 10 years down the road, you can start to get a little tremor creep back or a little slowness creep back. It's interesting. Um, so DBS was really born at a center in, in Grenoble, France. Uh, and I've been there several times to 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 see the people there that came up with this and see their patients. And they have patients that are, you know, 18 years in that look really good. Now, if you turn their stem off, they look like hell, right? Because they, they and we've done that too. We've had uh, studies where we have uh, implanted someone, they're 24 seven stimulated, and then they'll sign up for a research study for like a medication. And so we turn the stem off temporarily. And it, you know, it's five years after their surgery and they're shocked at how bad they've gotten with, you know, because they haven't noticed it because the stim has been making them look good. Yeah. But it's a very good question. It's not forever. So the mechanical interface, you're talking about the physical device itself or how we interact with it? Gotcha. So the question was, can we talk about how the device interfaces at the skull? So, uh, um, oh, Belinda, are you pulling out toys? <laughs> She's always got toys. So uh, to put it in, uh, we uh, make one or two incisions on the top of the head. And we have to drill a hole in the skull that's about the size of a dime. It's a pretty good size hole. And the reason for that is we, we want to cover the hole with something so you don't have a divot on the top of your head. We also have to anchor the electrode into position so it doesn't move. It, it, you know, we, we spend a lot of time and effort making sure it goes to the right spot. We want it to stay there. So there's a little device that screws onto the skull that mounts over the hole. Um, it's called a burr hole cap. And I, don't, I can't see that far. Is that what you gave him? Okay. It's a little plastic cap. Um, and, and, uh, if you have a thin scalp, which some people do, you may see it. You may see a little bit of a bump there. Um, now if you, if, if you've got a, a normal hairline, that's not a problem. If you're follicularly challenged like I am, uh, and, uh, you might be, you know, if you've got a thin scalp, you might see a little bump there. You can definitely feel it. If you feel the top of the head, you'll feel a bump there. So there's two bumps there. The wires run under the scalp. They connect to a second pair of wires that run down the side of the neck and into the battery pack. If you're gonna have something put in your brain, you want it to be as small as possible. Uh, the wire that goes down the side of the neck has to be a little more robust because the, you know, the movement of your neck as you're looking around and living your life, we want that wire to be a little stronger. 
So it's generally for most systems, it's constructed a little differently. So it's a little tougher. Um, so there's a little bump usually above and behind the ear on the side that the battery is. Um, is that, did, that, did that answer your question? Yeah. Correct. Uh, so that's a very good point. This is an entirely implanted system. So it, every part of it is underneath the skin. So you don't have horns. There's not wires sticking out. Um, we can, we, the clinicians and actually patients get a little controller. It looks like a little iPhone or an iPod. And you can check your settings. You can see if you're on. You can check your battery life. You can actually adjust your simulator settings a little bit. Um, but th that's a, all a wireless connection. There's not an actual plug. It, it's wireless right through the skin. Just like your, you know, the phone's now charged wirelessly. You put it on a little pad. So um, uh, it's basically like Bluetooth technology. Um, yes. And then I don't know if we have any, anyone online. Yes, sir. Well, <laughs> well, we can arrange that if you'd like. So you would assume you're going to be able to you know, give in the room. Um, because, I mean, I can hike six miles, but I used to hike 20. So <laughs> yeah. One earlier. And since I'm not 65 yet, is there any problem with that there's enough to be approved by Medicare or how does that work? And why does, why does it work for this community? Yeah. That's three questions. You said you only have three. Uh, let's do the insurance question because this is a common question. So Medicare pays for it and private insurers pay for it. Uh, and it's, it's, it's not a cheap therapy. Uh, I mean, if you take the whole hospital bill, you know, overnight stay, operating room, anesthesia, the cost of the device, it's like $130,000. It's, it's not cheap. Uh, insurers happily pay for it. And I've actually never had a Parkinson's patient denied coverage. Now, why is that? Uh, the medications that Parkinson's patients take are unbelievably expensive. Uh, if you take the cost of those medications over a 10 year period, most patients still need to take some medications, but they can usually reduce their medications. It's not unusual in a younger patient to reduce their meds by half or more. So if you're on half the medication that you're on with the cost that it is, uh, it's actually cheaper for them for you to have an operation. You're less likely to fall. You're less likely to break something. You're less likely to become disabled. So insurers usually, in my experience, always cover it. So that's not an issue. Why does it help dyskinesia? That's a damn good question. Um, we used to think it was because, you know, dyskinesias are a direct result of taking the medication. So the more meds you take, the more your dyskinesias are. If you have dyskinesias, you can stop them by not taking your medication, but then your symptoms get worse, right? Uh, so we initially it used to, th the thinking was, well, DBS makes dyskinesia better because we're reducing the medications. It's not just that though. There's a direct anti-dyskinetic effect of stimulation. Uh, and you can see it. You can take someone with a, an electrode in the subthalamic nucleus, for example, that's got bad dyskinesia, and you can just add it. You can just turn on this, the next ring above, and it'll go away without touching the meds. So the mechanism of why that is, we don't know. A more intriguing question is, how does this work at all? And we don't really know. Um, in the old days, we used to think, well, we used to we used to destroy part of the brain and that would make symptoms better. And now we're stimulating. So it, it, it must be like it must mimic the effects. Maybe it just shuts that part of the brain down. We now know that that's not true because we can uh, we can put tiny little electrodes next to the stimulating electrode. And we can see that that we're actually stimulating some areas, not just sort of inhibiting them. So uh, we don't really know exactly how it works. I think, and of course this must be right, um, I think it's a network issue. So I think there's, uh, and one of my mentors who was actually was a professor of neurology here in the, in the 90s and has been a couple of other places, his thinking is that this is, a, it, this is an abnormal pattern of activity and uh, this, the regular signal sort of normalizes that activity. And I think that's probably what it is. Uh, what was your first question? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna do it oh, we want to do it sooner. 
So, um, the, so this is interesting. People are thinking about doing it sooner. Um, there's a study out of Vanderbilt uh, that they're trying to start, and there was a study done in Europe looking at, at very early, and the very early means what, you know, less than five years from the time of diagnosis. The real answer to your question is, if, if uh, let's, say, let's say you, you're, you're diagnosed two years ago, you're taking you know, three tablets of cinnamon a day, and you're normal, uh, and you've got normal function, we're not going to make you any better than that. But we're going to give you a one percent risk of a stroke and a three percent risk of an infection. So why take on those risks if it's not going to it's not going to affect your disease progression? If it made your disease progress slower, hell yes, we'd do it. Right, we'd do it as soon as we could. But DBS doesn't do that. Um, so that's the reason. It's a it's a it's a it's a risk benefit ratio. We're not going to make you look any better, and you're just taking on this risk early on. Um, however, there's, you know, there's people that are advocating doing it sooner, but you still have to at least have a little blip. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Effects yeah, so so freezing a gate is very interesting. So just to be clear what that means, uh, uh, there are patients that have a hard time getting going, right? So you you stand up and you want to start walking and you just can't get your feet going. And, and you maybe take little stutter steps, uh, but you have, uh, or you're walking, but you come up to a doorway or you um, come into a tight enclosed space and you freeze. So this is very common when meds are wearing off. Uh, and most freezing is what we call an off phenomenon. So when the meds aren't working well, you'll do this. And that is the kind of freezing that most people have. And that gets better with meds and it gets better with DBS. There's a very specific type of freezing though. We call them on period freezers. And there are patients that freeze no matter whether their meds are, are working well or not. So it doesn't matter if they're on or off, they just freeze all the time. Those are on period freezers. And that's, that's a symptom that is very mysterious to us. We don't understand why that happens. It doesn't get better with meds. And if it doesn't get better with meds, is it gonna get better with simulation? No, it's not. I don't know why I'm picking on you. Yeah, okay. well, I haven't picked on Brian. Poor Brian is you know at home. It's, you know, Brian, we're picking on you next. So, um, uh, so that's one of the questions that I always ask. If they if they, if they freeze, uh, if they have freezing, I always we really want to drill down and make sure we understand that. And uh, you know, when we see new patients, it's not a it's not a fifteen minute visit. I mean, I always schedule an hour with all my new patients because you really have to drill down on these questions. And I had a lady at my old place that uh, before we really understood this. She had a really bad tremor. She had a really bad slowness of moving and she had really bad freezing a gait and everything got better except her freezing a gait. And she was not happy. She, she looked great, but you know, that's a pretty disabling thing. If you freeze every time you come through a doorway, I mean, we have to come through doorways quite a bit in our lives. So um, we still don't have a good answer for that. makes you on you have more freezing afterwards uh, that, that, yeah it, it doesn't uh that's a good question it didn't make her freezing worse but it just did not make it better um and shortly after i operated on her there, this paper came out of italy and then this paper came out of of australia and that there's this different part of the circuit that we can stimulate. It's called the PPN, the pedunculopontine nucleus. Everything in medicine has to have a name that long. And uh, they said, hey, this is good for freezing a gate. And um, it turns out that it is for about three months or so. And then it comes right back. And uh, we got excited. And we in San Francisco, where I was before, we implanted about half a dozen people. And they would get better for maybe six, eight, 10 weeks, and then they would slump right back and we could never regain the benefit. So there's a lot we still don't understand about Parkinson's itself, about these other disorders that are Parkinsonian-like. Uh, so we still have a lot to learn. Anyone online? I feel like I'm ignoring online people. 
Um, there is a question about an app on your phone to adjust DBS settings. Is this common? Yeah, so uh, every system, everyone that gets a system, whether it's an Abbott system or a Medtronic system or a Boston Scientific system, uh, there's a, uh, uh, you get a patient controller. It, it generally looks like an iPhone or an iPod, uh, and you can use it to interact with your device. You can, you can just do simple things like check, check the battery level, make sure it's on. You can see what your settings are. Uh, uh, if your neurologist gives you permission, you can actually, uh, adjust your stimulation settings up and down, which can actually help especially uh, right after we implant people, if they have the ability to sort of adjust their simulator settings. So uh, everyone that gets a system has that capability. Uh, some people, it scares the bejesus out of them and they don't want to touch it. And that's fine. We can just do everything. Uh, but uh, we do empower people to have that, that ability. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so oh. So uh, yeah, so for Abbott, there's an actual app that you can put on your own phone. And I believe that's unique to Abbott. <laughs> Just like you to bring it up. Yeah. <laughs> Did you plant that question? Yeah. Well, that's fair enough. Yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Okay. All right. There you go. All right. Uh, was another one. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we, so I, uh, you know, I, 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 my career, I, I basically do one a week. So I do about, I don't know how many that is a year. I'm not very good at math. I shouldn't know what I'm but, but we do, you know, we do, um, I mean, it's, uh, you know, this, this kind of, this is a valid question, by the way, to ask, and this doesn't just apply to DBS, it applies to hip replacements. And, but when you go, if you go see a surgeon, ask them how many of these they do, because it's an, actually, it's an important thing. Um, so at Banner, for example, uh, my practice at Banner is just, it's just all DBS. I don't take care of spine patients or brain tumor patients, or it's all I do. As my wife points out, I have a very limited skill set. <laughs> um, and none of it is useful at home, by the way. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yes, sir. The probe you talked about before, you said they have eight segments on it. Yes. And they also have those divided into three pieces. Correct. Is that true across the line? And it, it it is so uh the the uh that eight contact one the one with the eight rings uh that came out briefly that was that was made by boston scientific it's still on the market um but uh that's kind of fallen away to these four rings where the middle two are split into the three and we call it a one three three one arrangement and most of the brain targets we implant are so small that that eight one just doesn't make a lot of sense. We'd rather have the surfaces actually in the in the area. So all three manufacturers now have electrodes with those segmented rings, and um, uh, it's it uh, we it was a long time coming. We have it now, and uh, I I I know that that people are working on actually having all four rings segmented. Um, you have to imagine, you know, uh, you want the, you want the, the wire to be small, uh, and you want it to be uh, durable. And, you know, if you start making a, a, a you know, and just a, a, a ridiculous amount of stimulating surfaces, the device gets to, it gets to be too big or the number of wires, it just starts to become too fragile. So there's kind of a happy medium. And, um, you know, I think we're kind of getting getting to that point where we're kind of in a good place as far as the hardware goes. Um, but, uh, yeah, the electrodes have never been more sophisticated than they are now. This actually, I'm going to go back to your question about why weights, right? So I'll see patients that are a bit early. Uh, they're not fluctuating yet or they don't have dyskinesia. And, um, and they say, well, you know, what, what difference is a year or two going to make? So two years ago, 18 months ago, uh, we did not have 
all three companies with these little segments of leads. Um, uh, the battery packs are getting more and more sophisticated. They're getting smaller. They're gaining the ability to sense um, some of them. I'll, I'll, I'll pick on Abbott since they're here. Um, plus, she'll slash my tires if I don't talk nicely about them. Uh, but um, they have a really nice feature where your neurologist can remotely program you so you don't have to come to the clinic. And the cardiac people have had this for a long time, right? Cardiac pacemakers, if you have an implanted pacemaker, for years, the cardiologist has been able to, to remotely check on your device. So now we can do that with DBS. Right now, Abbott is the only company that, that does that. Uh, but I'm sure in another year or two, all three companies will probably be doing it. Um, the only company that has sensing ability right now is Medtronic. We don't know what to do with that technology yet, but in a couple of years, we will. And I think in a couple of years, I think all three companies will have that. So the fact that there are multiple players now on the, on the, in the market, it's actually, uh, it's actually very good for, it's very good for me and it's very good for you uh, because we've got fancier and fancier and better and better devices all the time. Can I hear me? Yeah. Yeah, hearing aids, hearing aids, cardiac devices. Is this the same sort of technology? So you have electrodes put in the back and they have. Yeah, that's called a spinal cord stimulator. And, and it's the same. In fact, a lot of this, a lot of this is very similar to that in terms of how patients interact with their device. It's very similar. Yeah, yeah. Get a question in the back and then we'll come on. Good question. So uh, th there's two flavors of the battery pack. There's a, there are rechargeable ones and non-rechargeable ones. Um, rechargeable batteries are smaller. Uh, they will last for 15 years if you keep them properly recharged. Um, so they're very nice. I mean, uh, when a battery dies or is close to dying, we have to replace it. And it's a surgical procedure to replace it. So it's about a, it's about a 30, you know, 20 minute outpatient procedure. We put you to sleep. We just reopen that old incision. We take the old battery out, new battery goes in. You go to recovery for about an hour and then go home the same day. Um, for, uh, so for a rechargeable battery, you only have to have that every 15 years. Um, sounds good you do have to recharge it. And some people are not very disciplined about doing that. Uh, some people don't want to, they travel a lot or they just simply don't want to think about, you know, their device. They don't want to have to worry about it. I had a friend who just couldn't wait to buy an electric car. And now he's just stressed out all the time about what the battery level is. He's like, I gotta get home. I gotta, you know what I mean? So um, there are non-rechargeable batteries. They only last three to four years, maybe. Four years would be good. Three is a little closer to the average. Um, and they have to be replaced so that frequently. Um, the advantage of them is that you just you don't have to think about them. So uh, you don't have to recharge them. You don't have to, if you're going to travel, you don't have to take a charger with you. Uh, and so for people that either are disciplined or just don't want to be tied down, that's a better option. Um, there's a subtle advantage, I think, to non-rechargeables, and that is, it's kind of like leasing a car. So I just told you a few minutes ago, the technology is always getting better. And uh, if you're getting a battery every three years or four years, you're always gonna get the latest battery, right? And for the rechargeable batteries, uh, we can do firmware updates, so you can do a software update to it. But if some amazing hardware technology came out and like a new circuit that you just couldn't do a, a firmware update, you know, and you wanted a brand new one of these things, talking about insurance companies, I'm not so sure an insurance company would say, well, you know, you have a rechargeable battery you just had put in five years ago. You want this new fancy battery, but this thing's got 10 years on it left. We're not gonna, we're not gonna pay for that. We've never been in that situation before, but I could see a situation potentially in the future where that might happen, if that, if that makes sense. So um, I think the decision to do a rechargeable or non-rechargeable is kind of a lifestyle and kind of personality decision. 
which may sound like a weird thing to say, but that's what it comes down to. Can you speak to what it requires to recharge? So it's wireless. So um, uh, a typical one is there's a little, there's like a little um, a shawl or a little thing that hangs around your neck. There's a little puck that you leave on a charging stand and it will charge the puck up. So the puck is charged. You take it off the little charging stand, you slip it in this little collar, a little shawl, so that it's hanging over the battery and it just wirelessly recharges you through the skin. So now some of them are more effective than others. So for example, Medtronic was the first to have a rechargeable battery. Um, uh, it is a very good battery. It, it, I tell patients, if you have a Medtronic device and you have a rechargeable, you should really recharge it a little bit every day. Uh, it takes about 10, 15 minutes a day to, to keep it fully charged. So if you don't charge for four days, you might be sitting there for an hour waiting, you know, getting it to recharge. Boston Scientific has a rechargeable. I think their rechargeable technology is a little bit better. Uh, many patients only have to do it twice a week for maybe 30 minutes. So, um, uh, you know, there, there are pluses and minuses to all these systems. And for people that, that come in and are a candidate and, are, and, and want to have surgery, we kind of talk through all these different options. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Or we could bit a big plug in your forehead like this thing. <laughs> Yes. If I, if I understand right, it's like when you're off and it senses that, or when you're disconnected, it, it, you basically get your DBS when you need it. You know, personally. How far is that from being uh, you know, available? So the question was I, we haven't been doing a good job of repeating the questions online for the online folks. So. Um, so the question was, uh, this sort of personalized stimulation, the sensing capability, um, uh, how close are we to that is kind of that, the kind of bottom line. So uh, a good example would be uh, when we're sleeping, we probably don't need to use full strength stimulation if someone's sleeping. We know that if you turn the stimulation completely off, uh, like, let, let's say you turned it off at night before you went to bed. When you wake up, you're going to be very symptomatic. You're going to have symptoms. And it can take hours and hours for the for the symptoms to get better as it ramps up. It's, some symptoms get better immediately, like tremor. Things like slowness of movement and stiffness can take a long time to get better. So we tell patients to leave it on all the time. So, um, but, it, you know, the reality is while we're sleeping, we probably could cycle back some percentage, 30 percent or maybe 50 percent. You could get another year of battery life out of a non-rechargeable battery if you were able to cycle back, let's say, 50 percent for eight hours out of a 24 hour period. Um, so that's a very practical reason why sensing is is very interesting. So again, you know, uh, Medtronic has the ability to sense, uh, uh, and there are centers now that are doing studies to try to look for these little bio signals, like my partner found for dyskinesia. Um, and then what do we do about it? So uh, it's 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 a kind of a grassroots movement, right? Because you have to record from a bunch of brains to figure out what the signals are, and then you have to try to figure out how do we change the simulation to make it better. So you know, people realize, you know, a couple of people in San Francisco or a couple of people in London who were doing this can't figure this out. It's got to be a bunch of people. So they kind of put those put those devices out in the market and individual centers can choose to study it and try to figure it out. So um, I think they're laying the groundwork and I, I have zero doubt that all three companies are going to have sensing capability very soon. And uh, uh, we'll know how to leverage that technology. So uh, it's very exciting. Is that going to be different equipment or is that built into the pro? So the question was, are the sensors built into the equipment? They're built into the, uh, the battery pack. So um, what it does is, you know, you know, there are the different little, like, for example, the rings on the electrode. What it will do is it'll use, it'll use some of the rings to stimulate. Uh, but it may pause stimulation for a second or two and record from those or other ones, or it will record from other ones while stimulation is happening.
but the real the real specialized equipment is in the battery pack the the the, the circuitry to record and store information lies in the battery pack so that's the thing that's different yeah. i'm going to give you some questions from online okay Beside the surgical type negative side effects to DBS insertion, are there other negative side effects to look out for? Yeah, so there's the, what well, I kind of focused on the surgical side effects, you know, like bleeding and infection. I, I kind of alluded to this a little bit, but, uh, you know, if we get greedy and we turn the stimulation up very high, we are going to spread stimulation into these other areas and it can affect speech or it can affect um, uh, tingling. Uh, there's some evidence that it can affect mood if you stimulate, uh, for example, in the subthalamic nucleus, if you stimulate sort of deep, in very rare cases, it can affect mood. So there can be these sort of stimulation cause side effects. You can always get rid of a stimulation cause side effect by simply turning the stimulation back down or changing the shape, and that will get rid of that side effect right away. Um, uh, one of my old nurses uh, used to, uh, she had this uh, great saying, so a lot of patients, they want their walking to be really, really good, really normal again. And to do that in some patients, you need to turn the stimulation up high enough that it can start to affect the speech. Um, so uh, she would frequently uh, change the settings. People were walking really well, and she'd send them home, and then a week later, they come back and say, you know, I, I, my, I feel like my speech is a little off. You know, my, my words are a little slurry. And her favorite thing was saying, okay, well, we can turn it down and your speech is going to get better, but your walking is not going to be as good. So do you want to walk or do you want to talk? That's mm -hmm. what she would always say. Do you want to walk or do you want to talk? So there is this balancing of, of, um, of getting potential side effects by stimulating very big areas. I wouldn't really say that that's a risk because we have control over that. But that's something to think about. Uh, could be, could be, yeah, yeah. Uh, next question: How often do patients get referred to PT or even OT after DBS? And do you know of any evidence that therapy combined with DBS compared to without therapy results in better mobility outcomes? Yeah. So did you have someone plant this question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, in some ways, that's easy to say. I mean, there's there's very good evidence from multiple sources that the best thing that you can do as a patient is to remain active. The more active you are, uh, the less severe your symptoms are going to be, the better you'll be able to tolerate the symptoms you have. That's a no-brainer. Um, it's interesting, you know, there are surgeries that are done that require intensive rehabilitation, physical therapy afterwards, like a knee replacement or a hip replacement. It's funny, for the actual surgery of DBS is not, it's actually not a particularly painful operation to have, and it doesn't, it's not like a knee replacement or spine surgery where there's a physical mobility, you're, you know, you're, there's not a physical mobility issue because of the surgery itself. So we don't routinely do physical therapy like right after surgery. Uh, in fact, it's funny, you guys will find this funny. So we'll, we'll often our, uh, you know, the residents or the hospitalists or the nurses will put in a referral for physical therapy while they're an inpatient. So they've just had DBS surgery the day before, and it's the next morning, and a physical therapist comes in and they go, they start to evaluate them and they go, oh my God, you have Parkinson's disease. And they want to, they want to, you know, take them out of their home or they want to build ramps everywhere. And they really kind of go a little overboard. Um, so I shouldn't say this in this room, but I kind of try to keep the physical therapist away from them in the hospital. And then once they leave the hospital, uh, yes, if they need therapy, we're, we're very big proponents of that. Um, but it's not like a hip replacement where we know someone is, is, is going to need, you know, six, everyone needs six weeks of, of physical therapy, if that makes sense. I don't know if that answered your question. I don't know who asked that online. Um, I do. Let's see. There's one who's trying to, let's see. Uh, I was referring to outpatient. So thank you, Andrea. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, who is trying to get best settings, not how to guide? This is from Suzanne. I'm trying to piece this together. Recommendations for turning up versus turning down, depending on how they're presenting. I'm working with a page. Yeah, so um, that kind of gets into a little bit of the nitty gritty of, of programming the device. Uh, so just to make that generalizable for everybody. So there's a process after surgery. It's called programming. And this is the first three to maybe six months after surgery um, where uh, the neurology team is trying to find the, the, the best stimulator settings. And the best analogy uh, that I can give is this is like going to the eye doctor. Uh, where they put that ridiculous machine in front of your face and it's got the different lenses that they flip in there. And some of the lenses look terrible, right? That's blurry as hell and you can't see anything. And then some of them are pretty good. And they say, what's better, one or two, right? And you go through this iterative process of finding the right lenses. The stimulation is, is very similar. So this is not like flipping a light switch and all of a sudden everything is normal. Everyone's brain's a little different. In fact, for the patients in the room, your right side is usually not exactly like your left side. And that's because the Parkinson's is affecting the circuit on one side of your brain differently than it is on the other side. Um, and so there's this process of trial and error finding the right settings. We know generally where to start, um, but those settings don't work for everybody. So uh, there is a process, you know, everyone always focuses on surgery because it's the big dramatic thing. The real work of DBS is what comes in the months afterwards is finding the right settings uh, to optimize improvement and minimize these side effects. So um, that's, a, I think, a general way of answering Suzanne's question. Um, yeah. I, think I, got, I think those are the mostly online ones. Uh, any, anything else in the room? And how places centers are using it? And I was thinking, when will they be able to publish MRI guiding for you know other types of media? Yeah, I mean, how many centers are doing? Yeah, so so the question was the MRI guided technique. How many centers are doing it? And and when are we going to be able to compare that technique to the more traditional technique where patients are awake? Um, so there's about 60 centers now in the U.S. Um, that are using that technique. Um, we prefer the MRI guided version of it. There are also places like the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix also does a sleep DBS. They use a CAT scanner instead of an MRI. Um, I have a personal preference. I think an MRI is better because you see more detail. And so there's technical reasons why I think that's better. Having said that, Dr. Ponce is up at the BNI. That guy is outstanding. I would let him operate on me any day of the week. So, you know, there's there's different points. But that MR, specifically the MR guy to take, it's about 60 centers. In terms of comparing them, you know, what you really like to do scientifically, what you'd like to do if you're going to really compare two things is you have two groups of people and you do it one way in one group and the other way in another group. And, the, and ideally the patients don't know. So this is how medications get approved, right? You have a group of patients that get the real drug and you have a group of patients that get a sugar pill, a placebo. And then you look at the two groups and is there a difference? And if the medicine really works, the, the patients that get the real medication will get better and the placebo people won't. Um, so you'd like, that's called a blinded study. So the patients don't know. It's, it's, I, we haven't figured out a way to, to blind a study where patients are awake because they know they're awake and other people are asleep. You know what I mean? There's no way to blind that. Uh, but it's interesting you bring, you bring this up. So we, we've, we've, uh, we've tried to do that ourselves. So we've taken groups of patients that are similar and back at a period of time where we were doing awake surgery and a sleep surgery at our center, we would compare the groups. Uh, we just published a big paper. In fact, I don't even think it's out yet. Uh, looking at uh, our sort of 12-year experience with that system because it came out in 2010. Uh, so, um, uh, but it's 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 a hard way. But I think it's 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 kind of a win-win. It's easier on patients. It's more accurate, uh, and it's it's I think it's easier on surgeons. It's it gives us more confidence doing it. 
uh, that we're in the right spot. So um, I think awake surgery, uh, even though I'm still a big fan of it, it's the way I started out doing it. I think its days are kind of more and more numbered. It's not a bad thing. We're not using the same phones we did 30 years ago. Remember the long cords with the, you're too young. That was super long. Yeah. Other questions? There's one more in line. One more in line. Oh, shortness of breath ever a side effect? So no. Um, the shortness of breath is an interesting thing. Uh, some patients, as their meds wear off, they get this sensation of shortness of breath. So that's a that that is something I've definitely seen. But shortness of breath due to stimulation itself, no. We will see patients when we turn their stimulation, when we change their settings, they can have kind of a temporary, like a lightheaded feeling. Or um, I don't know why I'm looking at you when I ask the online stuff. It's like you're you represent the the, the internet. Um, people will will have a like a, a brief lightheaded sensation or kind of a weird like a flush sensation. But um, all of these targets, there's no part of the brain that we're stimulating that would affect the respiration center like that or, or, or shortness of breath. So not really, no. All right. Anything else? Got to let you eat dinner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's food. There's food. That's right. Are you you're with, are you with me tomorrow? Oh, just bring the leftovers. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, thank you guys for letting me take a chunk of your time online as well. And uh, and uh, have a good rest of the evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Larson. Of course.